This is European history. Version 2 of the, um, the Wednesday, June 9th lecture. And instead of suddenly bouncing back to the late Middle Ages and the Little Ice Age, we'll continue from where we were yesterday. Please do have your notes up. And thank you for both uh, the, both people who <laughs> tried to point it out to me. And the rest of you who certainly would have. Where we've been. Um, one of the pernicious problems in the world, uh, almost insoluble, uh, is the Arab-Israeli crisis. Um, and there are reasons for this. When the Jews are first settled in Palestine, Palestinian Arabs, which have no distinct identity at that point, reject the idea of an intrusion of foreigners into their land. And this rejection becomes ever more hostile. Jews and Palestinian Arabs take uh, terrorism as a method to deal with the British. The British, after the Second World War, are fatigued and they say, we're out of here. United Nations, you've got it. The UN comes up with a two-state solution, Israel and Palestine, both in the old areas of Palestine. But the Arabs and their leader, Haj Amin al-Husseini, the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem, say no. Uh, and despite the fact that the U.S. and the USSR both vote for this in 1947, when the British leave in 1948, there is a war intended to drive the Jews into the sea or exterminate them. Against all odds, the Israelis win. During this war, Husseini um, orders all loyal Palestinians to leave Israel and not work with them. Many Arabs were willing to do that. Those who were risked assassination. Many were killed by Palestinian terrorists, some of whom were aided by former Nazis. These Palestinians who leave, leave businesses and land behind. And uh, one of the sticking points is that pro-Palestinian uh, advocates today talk about a, quote, right to return, unquote, as if leaving a country when it's besieged involves a implicit right that when you lose the war and the country exists, you can return and reclaim your land. Now, it's not your land anymore. The Israelis say, no, it's like a salvage ship. Uh, you left it. You abandon it. You abandon us in our time of need. Um, no, we're, we're not going to grant you property rights that you abandoned in the midst of a crisis in order to defeat us. So the Palestinians, uh, Ar Ar Palestinian Arabs, um, who left under Husseini's orders are not permitted to return and, quote, reclaim, unquote, their land. This is not theirs anymore. Um, the Arab world, in all of its mercy, uh, treats the Palestinians like alien trash, putting them in concentration, no, I'm sorry, refugee camps. And these refugee camps are crowded, disease-ridden, unple unpleasant places that are breeding grounds for terrorism, which is what the Arab countries seem to want. They seem to want their Arab brothers to languish in exile without any means of supporting themselves at the mercy of the Arab governments who host them so that they can be bred to be fedayim, death commandos against the hated Jew. Well, if that was their plan, it worked because to this day, Palestinians who have been granted land in Gaza and on the West Bank as a result of Israel's repeated willingness to give land for peace have uh, insisted on electing terrorists to be their leaders. Abu Mazen, known otherwise as Mahmoud Abbas, has led the Palestinian Authority since the Israelis allowed it to be created and he's a PLO terrorist. So, there is an intransigence on the Arab side, both among the Palestinian Arabs and among their sponsors throughout the rest of the Islamic and Arab world. Israel attacks Egypt or in the Suez Crisis, um, goes back. In 1968, 
The Arabs are ready to strike Israel, but rather than wait to be hit, the Israelis launch a preemptive attack known as the Six-Day War or the June War. And in the Six-Day War, the Israelis massively increased the size of their country by destroying the Arab air forces on the ground in the first hours, and then by conquering the Sinai from Egypt all the way up to the Suez Canal, conquering the hill country between the Galilee and, Sir and Damascus, Syria, known as the Golan Heights, conquering East Jerusalem and the West Bank of the Jordan, and along with Sinai, they got Gaza. So now Israel has a very large, for its size, empire. And uh, what does what happens? Well, the Arabs are stunned. Nasser of Egypt dies, is replaced by Anwar Sadat, who also invests in massive amounts of Soviet hardware, updated. And Nasser, I'm sorry, and Sadat manages to infiltrate about a half a million men to the west bank of the Suez Canal without the Israelis knowing. The Israelis are hunkered down behind a defensive work called the Barlev Line. And uh, the front of this is a great berm, a great earthenwork dike or wall on the east side of Suez Canal with landmines and barbed wire and other fortifications fortifications designed to absorb or at least slow down an Egyptian attack. The Israelis not expecting attack, let most of their people who are in the military go home for the Yom Kippur holiday, that is the holiest day of the Jewish calendar, the Day of Atonement. The Arabs strike without warning, surprising the Israelis. They bring strange equipment down to the water aim the equipment at the bar lev line. These are fireboat pressure hoses, which are used to destroy paths through the earthenwork berm. Melting like a sandcastle in an incoming tide, key parts of the bar lev line are penetrated in the first hour. Soviet bridging equipment is used to cross the Suez, and Egyptian tank armies are deep behind the bar lev line by the end of the first day. The IDF is caught napping, the Israeli Defense Force responds, and the first response, aside from calling up its reserves and getting them ready to counterattack, is that the Israeli Air Force is sent in to destroy the Egyptian tank arms. By the way, Syria is simultaneously attacking in the north. The Israelis are not prepared for that either, across the Golan Heights. What to do? The Israeli Air Force fights, fights, uh, flies its way in to the area of the Barlev line defenses. It's a trap. The Soviet doctrine in the early 1970s is if it flies, it dies. The Egyptian army adopts this doctrine. The Egyptian army has, with Soviet help, acquired and uh, equipped their tank armies with thousands of heavy mobile anti-aircraft guns, and surface-to-air missiles. Suddenly, the sky over the Barlev line is full of stars, each star an exploding Israeli fighter bomber. The Israelis are shocked. Their air power, which had been supreme, was counteracted by an intense Soviet-style anti-aircraft defense. Now, the Egyptian plan was to hold here and challenged the Israelis to counterattack into the teeth of the Egyptian defenses, which have just proven themselves. But the Israelis are so off, uh, wrong-footed by this that in Syria, from the Syrian side, they continue to attack through the Golan, and the Egyptian army can't resist, and they start trying to retake the Sinai. And they both are driving towards the Israeli heartland. At this point, things get real. The Israelis have a plausible reason to wonder if the Arabs are actually going to win this one. If Arab armies drive into the Israeli heartland, it'll be another holocaust. Israel readies its nuclear deterrent. Its nuclear deterrent 
may not stop the Arab armies in the field, but it can, can turn Cairo, Egypt, and Damascus, Syria into glassed over radioactive deserts. Push comes to shove, the Israelis will not allow another Holocaust. They'll get out of fighting. We know it. The Soviets know it. The Arabs should know it. They're ignoring the fact. They press on. If Israel is pushed, and they nuke Cairo and Damascus, and as many of the tank armies as they can, um, the Arab world and the Third World and the anti-Western world will bleat and complain that Israel has just launched a nuclear first strike, destabilizing the world and risking World War III. They will beg the Soviets to nuke Israel. The Soviets probably wouldn't, but they might. If Soviet missiles hit the American ally Israel, that could provoke war in Europe, war in Asia, and ultimately global thermonuclear war. Remember, in the early 1970s, both sides are like gunfighters with hammers up, ready to even touch the trigger and depress the weapon and fire it at the other person's head. Nuclear Armageddon is on the agenda. President Nixon and Secretary of State Kissinger decide to do something different. They are going to prevent Israel from being desperate enough to launch. They are going to start an airlift to Israel akin to the Berlin airlift. Weapons, medical supplies, high technology defenses, all are provided to the Israelis. Live satellite information is provided to the Israeli general staff. We will not permit Israel to fall. The Israelis rally with our help through the airlift and through the intelligence sharing. The Israelis drive back and they even cross Suez into Egypt. They drive towards Damascus, the United Nations brokers a peace that goes back to status quo ante bellum. In other words, the borders before the Arab attack. It is at this moment that the war on terror begins. It is at this moment that the enemies of Israel realize that they will not be able to destroy Israel so long as America is capable of intervening in the Middle East. We demonstrate that by intervening in the Middle East. Why did we do it? To prevent a nuclear war. Do we get any credit for that by our enemies? Hell no. Absolutely not. Of course not. Because we now are the great Satan. The Israelis become the little Satan. Soon after that, um, Palestinian terror... Oh, no, no, this actually happened before. How can Israel be defeated with the Americans so willing to protect them? This becomes a question. The way is shown by what happened in the Olympics in 1972. In 1972, the Munich Olympics are held. This is the first time the Olympics are held in Germany since Hitler's day. It is a big deal. Palestinian terrorists capture the entire Israeli Olympic team, hold them hostage, and slaughter them. Hold them. Terrorism may be the way forward. The Arab world launches a oil embargo, which fundamentally changes American society. Don't for a moment believe that people suddenly woke up to letting women work in the workforce in massive numbers because feminists convinced people. That was part of it. The other part is that before the Arab oil embargo of 72, fuel was so cheap that everything was much less expensive. A working man with a union behind him could make enough money to own a house, a couple of cars, send their kids to college. For the first time in American history since World War II, we have middle-class lifestyles for working Americans. This changes because of the oil embargo. Before the oil embargo, a paperback book was less than a dollar. Fuel was well under a dollar a gallon. By 1979, during a second hour of oil embargo, paperback book, same product, is uh, $5.99, almost $6. Same product, nothing's changed, except the price of the fuel to use to transport it and to produce it. 
a gallon of gas is in excess of a dollar a gallon. It suddenly becomes impossible for the average American worker to support his family on one paycheck in order to maintain the middle class lifestyle to which they had become accustomed. Many American families have wives go into the workforce to provide two incomes so that the family can, again, send their kids to college, keep the house, keep the cars, keep all of that. This is a fundamental change in the American society and the American family, and it is one of the things that leads to the current um, workforce, which is female as well as male, and the current situation of American marriage, where over 50% of people who get married get divorced, and where so many people grow up in broken homes. All of this can be attributed to the Yom Kippur War and the Arab oil and war embargo that changes the American economy on a basic level by increasing the price of oil. The next time the price of oil becomes a topic of conversation, remember that. Remember, one commodity is so important, was and is, that it can transform our entire society in front of our eyes in just a few years. The Arab-Israeli conflict eases in the late 1970s. President Sadat, after the Yom Kippur War, thinks that the Egyptian army kicked by. And he's right. Until the American intervention, they were winning the war. From that position of apparent strength, Sadat negotiates with the Prime Minister of Israel, Menachem Begin, and the President of the United States, Jimmy Carter, the Camp David Accords. This is the best thing that President Carter did, objectively an incredible achievement. What it does is it creates peace between the Egyptian army, which rules Egypt, and Israel. It is the first, and for decades, the only Arab government willing to negotiate peace with a state of Israel. In other words, to allow the state of Israel to exist, to abandon the idea of driving the Jews into the sea. Without the Egyptian army, the Arabs cannot win a conventional war against Israel. It has to be a war of terror, and some Arab country or Muslim country needs to acquire nuclear weapons to counter the Israelis. This is why the Iranians have been for decades desperate to acquire nuclear weapons. They're not Arabs, but they are Muslims. And they are wildly anti-Semitic and interested in destroying Israel. Again, with, quote, God's cleansing fire, unquote. Sadat, for making peace with the Jews, is assassinated by his own bodyguards less than two years later. However, Mubarak, Sadat's successor, keeps the peace until he is overthrown in 2010. Briefly, there's an Arab Brotherhood or a Muslim Brotherhood government in Egypt. The army overthrows that, thank goodness, because the Muslim Brotherhood government in Egypt was going to abandon. They were moving towards abandoning peace with Israel. The Egyptian army is back in control, and the Egyptian army is therefore out of the equation. There will not be, while Egypt and Israel are at peace, a conventional war against Israel for the enemy of Israel has a chance of winning. In the early 1980s, in the nation of Lebanon, north of Israel, there is a Palestinian presence that's lobbing missiles into Israeli communities. The Israelis go into Lebanon. We go into Lebanon to try to act as peacekeepers. Uh, we're hit by a car bomb in a hotel where over 200 Marines are murdered by the terrorists. We pull out. Not our, not our finest hour. The Arab-Israeli conflict continues, but with the end of the Cold War, there is a real hope of peace. Like in South Africa, the Soviets are no longer going to bankroll the anti-Jewish Arabs. So, a new peace settlement is made. The Prime Minister of Israel that negotiates this settlement is shot by, I think, yeah, one of his own people, a Jewish nationalist, who thinks he gives away too much. This piece uh, allows for the Sinai Peninsula, I'm sorry, the Sinai Peninsula has been returned to the Egyptian army as part of the Camp David Accords. The Gaza Strip and the West Bank of the Jordan River 
because of the peace treaty arranged in the 90s, is going to become Palestinian territory. It will be the Palestinian state that they've craved for so long. It is a two-state solution. But instead of electing a government that supports peace, as I said before, Palestinians elect a government that insists on an ongoing war. The people who live in this Palestinian region, instead of getting the benefit of international aid that would enrich them and allow them to lead decent lives, universities for their kids, hot and cold running water in their homes, use all of their power to destroy, try to destroy Israel. They send children as terrorists with vest bombs, women as terrorists, both against Islamic law, men as terrorists. And most recently, in the late 20 teens, there was a stab campaign where little girls go on television saying and singing, stab, stab, stab. If you see a Jew, what do you do? Stab, stab, stab. It's creepy. And if I had more time, I would show you the app. The irreconcilability of the Palestinians to any kind of peace is a big problem. Yeah. So have you seen a movie that's called Jojo Rabbit? No. I know it's about the Nazis yes. and Hitler. It's uh, at the end of the war, and it's about the Hitler youth, basically. Mm -hmm. But at the very end of the war, it shows like to what extent the Nazis tried to keep out every single person in Berlin. Right. They just tried to get everyone out. And there's a scene in the movie where there's tanks rolling in and American soldiers and British and French soldiers rolling into Berlin. And there's a school teacher. And the school teacher pats a kid on the head, straps a stick grenade to the back of the kid and says, go give that man a hug. And that's... Yeah, I'm not sure I buy that for a couple of reasons. And I'm not trying to make anyone look foolish, least of all, of all you, because I appreciate that. I've been told I should see them. The Russians took Berlin, not the Americans, number one. While the Germans did do some suicide attacks, that's on the edge of what they did. That would be much more common for the Japanese to do than the Germans. Then again, did it happen from time to time? Probably. It certainly is something that happens in, in Iraq and Afghanistan during the war on terror. And it's the sort of thing that happens in Israel as well. Um, go give that man a yeah, yeah, I think that was more done as just like a dark My stepfather's brother was on a half track in Vietnam. He had to cut a kid in half because he saw another kid run up to a half track in front of his and uh, toss a bouquet of flowers that was really grenades. And the little kid was coming towards his half track with flowers. And he shouted and waved, and the kid just kept coming. So, never got over that. He never got over that. Anyway, really nasty stuff. Um, one sign of hope in the Arab Israeli conflict is that in the last months of the Trump administration, a series of Gulf countries and other Arab countries also made peace with Egypt, with Israel. For the first time since 1979, when uh, Egypt makes peace, 1978, we have several other countries do it. Why? Because their fear of a nuclear and an aggressive Iran outweighed their hatred of the Jews. I have not seen this trend continuing under the present administration. That isn't Biden's fault. This is me saying it's not Biden's fault. It's just the people realign when they see a new American administration. They want to recalculate the risks of taking sides. But the Iranians scare many Arabs so much that uh, they are willing to make peace with the Jews in return, at least some of them are, in return for uh, an anti-Iranian alliance. So that goes on and on. I am pro-Israel. What you just heard is an analysis from a pro-Israel point of view. Um, you will certainly have no difficulty finding pro-Palestinian points of view. Um, I cannot bring myself to argue their point because of the deep, deep disbelief that I have for their sincerity. Maybe it's a, it's a fault of mine. You know, it, it just now, we go to the subcontinent. 
India versus Pakistan. Why? At independence in 1947, the British suddenly leave. A few months, done, gone. Gandhi wins. But the Arab League, the Muslim League within India, refuses to become part of what they call Hindustan, which is the larger region of India. They do not want to be an Islamic minority in a Hindu state or in a multi-religious state. Does that sound familiar? So they insist on separating out the Muslim regions of Italy as Pakistan. But the Muslim regions exist in what we call today Bangladesh, which was then East Pakistan, and uh, the main Indus Valley region, which is now West Pakistan, or which used to be West Pakistan, is now just Pakistan. In the north, where India and Pakistan meet the Himalayas, there's a region called Jammu and Kashmir. We'll just call it Kashmir. Kashmir has a large Islamic population. But despite this, it goes to India, at least parts of it do. Why? Because the ruling presidential house of India at that time was the, ha was, was the family of a guy named Nehru. Nehru is Gandhi's political ally. Nehru becomes the first president of an independent India, what the Muslims call Hindustan. Nehru's from a Brahmin prince family in Kashmir. To give up Kashmir because of its Muslim majority would involve the president of India giving up his ancestral lands. He's not willing to do this. So the Indians hold on to as much of Jammu and Kashmir as they can. The Pakistanis resent this, and this creates pretext for war. In 1947, add to this pretext the fact that millions, tens of millions of people are on the wrong side of the border when the British finally announce what the border is between India and Pakistan. So in the course of leaving their homes, and moving across the border to where they're the majority, or of staying in their homes and being a ghettoized minority, millions are at risk and hundreds of thousands are killed. This creates even more bad blood. Gandhi, the pacifist who starves himself and raises peaceful um, resistance against the British, is shot by a Hindu nationalist because he allowed Pakistan to form as an independent country. And the Hindu nationalist wanted an undivided British India handed over to the Hindu majority. He thought Gandhi sold them out, so he killed him. So there's war in the initial phase, then it settles down. Then India is invaded by China across the Himalayan mountains in the early 1950s. Just after China conquers Tibet, it also then tries to march into India. The Indians fight back, push the Chinese back to the current line of control. In 1965, there is another full-scale war between India and Pakistan. In the early 1970s, there is a smaller war. In these wars, Bangladesh is separated from Pakistan. So India doesn't feel surrounded by the same country on both sides. Bangladesh is one of the poorest countries on earth. It's basically an entire nation of people in a floodplain that floods every few years. So Bangladesh is a giant human rights disaster. Without India or the rest of Pakistan to sustain it, its people completely depend upon foreign aid. And then in the late 1990s, both India and Pakistan get nuclear weapons. India is now ruled not by the House of Nehru, but by a Hindu nationalist party. President Modi of India is no friend of the Chinese or of the Pakistanis, who are their allies. And the Pakistanis have been ruled by a series of military dictatorships for the last few decades. So there is tension between India and Pakistan that you should know about. Oil is the great um, fuel of modern times. Oil becomes the great fuel during World War I and remains such. Oil is liquefied dinosaur bones and ancient forests. Oil is a finite resource. 
the United States was an exporter of oil through the 1950s. Then it became an importer of oil, cheap oil from the Middle East. Then the Arab oil embargo raises the price of oil. People wonder about the sustainability of oil. They say that the oil will run out in the late 2000s. But then we develop fracking technology, which allows us to get oil from shales, the shale sands. And um, over the last few years, the United States was still, was again a net exporter of oil. What is the alternative to oil? Nuclear power, hydroelectric power. Don't give me wind and solar. Those are technologies that are not mature yet. They cannot provide proper electricity. Those people who buy electric cars to virtue signal are getting those electric cars powered by mostly coal power plants. Nuclear power of one kind or another is the best answer to fossil fuels. But nuclear power is scary, because if you mess up, you've got radioactive waste all over the place. People talk about fusion power, but we're not there yet. The most effective, efficient, and safe nuclear power plants are not the big ones that are set up for civilian use. They are reactors on nuclear submarines. And if we chose to use submarine-style reactors, more of them, but smaller, more effective, more efficient, more clean, um, we might actually have a revolution where we have cheap electric power. The problem is that fission plants are basically steam engines. They require the conversion of water to gas to turn turbines. That's where the electricity comes from. The water is heated by radioactive rods. The rods go in the water, the water steam, the rods come out of the water, the waters don't. So what happens to the steam that's now irradiated? That becomes liquid again. That is the radioactive waste. You do not have, yet have a way of converting the nuclear process directly to electricity without that phase of it becoming steam and turning turbines. The steam produces nuclear waste. Nuclear waste is a liquid that can poison a watershed for thousands of years. We don't have a solution. We can't yet shoot it into space. And even if we could, any rocket accident would spew it all over uh, the land. There is a plan to put it inside a sealed mountain, but you got to truck it there. You got to ship it there by train. Um, that's a problem with nuclear power. To my understanding, the water that actually touches the, uh, radi the radioactive metals, the uranium uh, rods, uh, is in a sealed system, and so it boils the water the closer the two rods get together, they go together, and then they make the energy, and the water's there to cool it. Mm -hmm. But the thing that actually gets hot is the actual reactor itself, and that reactor is surrounded by water, which steams, and then is went through a turbine. But I don't think, correct, I don't know if it's not like 100%, but the steam that is made from the water outside of the reactor is not actually radioactive, because that's how they can put uh, radio... Uh, yeah, it's sealed water, yeah. but that sealed water eventually needs to be replaced. Yeah. And it's that, repla you know, once once you get rid of the old water, that's the nuclear waste. Yeah. And it's a, it's, it's a problem. It's it's a real problem. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't know, personally, nuclear power is my favorite out of all the mm -hmm. alternatives. I just like... I like hydropower yeah. myself, but nuclear power is a quick number but, two. You know, I'm a bit biased because I, I I have a science YouTube channel I like to watch. And yeah. at one point he put out a poll, you know, if you are more of a solar supporter or if you would put up with a nuclear reactor in your backyard. And about 80% of the people that watched him said, put a nuclear reactor in my backyard. Wow. That's unexpected. But he said, I, I he said he didn't expect this either. But then again, he has a really, like... His, um, it's a select, self-selecting audience. Yeah, that, at the poll. you know, we enjoy his content. We, yeah. we think that is so uh, In America in the late 1970s, we had a nuclear accident called Three Mile Island, Pennsylvania. And we haven't built a proper nuclear plant in the country since then yeah. because of panic. There was a, uh, uh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, there is uh, some African country. I can't remember exactly which one. It's one that's in North Africa, yeah. in the Sahara. And what they're doing is they're putting millions of dollars into making this giant solar farm. It's a, kind of almost a replica of one that was built pre-World War II by the British. 
Hmm. And uh, the British built it and then disassembled it for uh, stuff for World War II because they needed more materials. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's basically just giant half pipes, really, that stretch like, hundreds of miles. I and have no problem like, with people doing stuff like that. I yeah. just, you know... But the, the thing about it is they expect that by, I think, 2022, they will be the largest exporter of energy in Africa and will set, uh, like, like exportation lines to Europe and can fuel pretty much half of France. That would be great. That No, that would be wonderful. It'll be interesting to see if that works, how they will leverage that power that they will have. The Russians have leveraged uh, their uh, natural gas pipelines to Western Europe to uh, <clears throat> mute Western European protests against Russian aggression. Bless you. So those who ship you power, to an extent, have influence over you. When I lived in Maine, Maine is the Saudi Arabia of water. Maine has incredible amounts of river and lake. <clears throat> we have so, we, I say we, I lived there so long, have so much possibility of hydropower, but the environmentalists kept worrying about the fish. Maine could have solved all of its economic woes by building 10 or 20 hydro dams <clears throat> and exporting power to the rest of New England, to New York, to uh, uh, Quebec and New Brunswick, the Atlantic provinces. But no, 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 we can't build dams, the salmon, the fish, oh God. And who knows, maybe you agree. <clears throat> it's a free country. Um, China. Mao takes over in 49. Chinese society becomes regimented in a way it never has, at least not since the first sovereign emperor, Qin Shi Huangdi. Qin Shi Huangdi is Mao's real role model, not Marx, not Lenin. <coughs> Maybe Stalin. But Qin Shi Huangdi was a legalist. Legalism basically says we will make laws about everything, and anyone who violates those laws we will punish. Confucianism is the opposite of that. It inspires people to be socially harmonious. Communism and legalism, very similar. Very similar in the way they run things. So lots of people die as the communists establish power over everyone and everything. In the late 1950s, Mao decides he's going to collectivize Chinese agriculture, just like Stalin did in 1928. And it had the same results, except on a larger scale. In the Great Leap Forward, China became a famine society. Tens of millions of people starved to death in a man-made famine caused by the Chinese government's insistence <clears throat> on taking peasants out of the decision-making process placing college boys from town who have degrees but don't have any personal experience with farming in charge of agriculture and forcing everyone to do what the central government told them to do. No one had autonomy. No one had the ability to make choices except for the government and tens of millions starved. Within the Communist Party of China, resistance against Mao strengthens. And uh, they basically say, you're killing too many of our people. And Mao says, there's always more of us. We're China. Uh, in other words, he laughs at the notion that we're killing too many people. One of Mao's most famous quotes is that history comes out of the barrel of a gun. But Mao ultimately, by the early 1960s, is forced to stop the Great Leap Forward. And he seems to take it with good grace. But now Mao never takes any defeat with good grace. In 1965, Mao acts against party officials who opposed the Great Leap Forward. He enlists young people from the cities and from the countrysides, from junior high schools and high schools and universities. The Communist Party engages in a purge that, again, is inspired by Stalin's purges, but on a much more massive and thoroughgoing scale. Fourteen-year-olds are enlisted into Red Guards units. They are given little red books, which are sayings of Chairman Mao, which is their Bible, and the standard by which everything will be judged. They are given AK-47 assault rifles and lots of ammo, and they are given the power by Mao of life and death over everyone in the society. Every community, every farm, every village, every city neighborhood 
began to have red guards come through. If you're a teacher, how dare you look down on your students? You were in hierarchy over your students. Wear a dunce cap. Spend hours getting verbally and physically assaulted by the rest of the village. Stand on your knees uh, and maybe we'll cop chop your head off or we'll shoot you uh, or we'll send you to a labor camp or we'll beat you to death or we'll let you live but as a, a symbol of what happens when you put yourself over the people. People were killed for anything that offended a 14-year-old's understanding of Mao's orthodoxy. Lord of the Flies has nothing on what genuinely happened in the People's Republic of China from 1965 until 1975. It is the biggest bloodletting in human history, and Mao did it to get control of his party. I don't, and this is one of the things I hate about having to rush this, I do not have the time to go into the detail that this deserves. This is something almost no Americans know about. Great Leap Forward and the Cultural Revolution between them, plus the measures Mao took in the first 10 years of his reign to get control of China. Between 80 million Chinese and 120 million Chinese are murdered by their own government in peacetime. That is unprecedented. Stalin doesn't come close to that. Hitler doesn't come close to that. It is a bloodbath without exception. And the girl I knew who grew up in China, who's now the wife, I will call you, the wife of my uh, best friend, she grew up with that. And her family had two strikes against it. Her father's family were aristocrats and military generals, and her mother's family were Chinese Christians. And both were targeted for destruction. She was repeatedly beaten in school by the other kids with the teacher applauding because this is payback. I will never get behind anything that blames the descendant of someone for the ancestor's sin. That is why I am utterly, absolutely against any of this modern race theory stuff which blames you for people that look like you and their actions taken out of context hundreds of years ago. Yes? So, were there, for the younger generation that was being raised to, like, look out for these things, were there specific, like, targets that they were looking for? Was it, like, educators? The four olds, which is old ways of thinking, old ways of living, manners. They, they went after the language and redesigned writing and speaking. Everyone was given a new name. Basically, anything that was of the old culture. One of the most laughable things about contemporary China, the Chinese Communist Party today, is that it claims to be the inheritor of 5,000 years of Chinese culture, and its great claim to fame is that it raised the people of China out of poverty. Well, that 5,000-year culture was systematically murdered by, the, by, by, the, uh, by Mao during the Cultural Revolution. They destroyed that culture. The only place that traditional Chinese culture exists is in the Chinese diaspora in places like Chinatown and San Francisco and in Taiwan, which they want to destroy. It existed in Hong Kong, but they're in the process of destroying it right now. Um, so the four olds, which is the old ways of living. As to raising uh, tens of millions of people, a uh, billion people out of poverty, yeah, they did it. A poverty they caused in the Great Leap Forward and in the Cultural Revolution. Anyone who had anything in China was despoiled. It was taken. And then after 75, foreign investment allowed China Chinese people to increase their living standard. So the Communist Party put the people in poverty. They're claiming virtue for having taken out of poverty. And they destroyed the traditional Chinese culture that they claim to be the inheritors of. You can't get more Orwellian than what this is. I wish I had more time. Hong Kong, 1970. Um, sorry, 19, actually wrote 77. Hong Kong, 1997 and 2020. Uh, the British leave their crown colony of Hong Kong in 1997. The treaty says that for 50 years there will be two systems, one country that the Communist Party of China will keep their mitts off of Hong Kong, and everyone believes the Chinese Communist Party when they say, we will, because you don't want to kill the goose that lays the golden egg. Hong Kong, this little tiny island, 
had an eco economic power that matched the rest of the mainland. That's how powerful Hong Kong was. But it all depended upon British ideas of freedom. It worked. But throughout the last, throughout the Xi Jinping period since the 2014-2015, the Chinese Communist Party has been turning the screws on Hong Kong. And last year was the death knell. The Chinese Communist Party passes a national security law that makes any Chinese anywhere, including here in the United States, oddly enough, the law allows the punishment of anyone who is Chinese who in any way shows disrespect. Shows disrespect for the Chinese Communist Party. How do you define disrespect? Well, they don't, because this allows them the widest possible powers to detain people. People in Hong Kong who questioned this law were taken away and have been taken away to the mainland uh, Chinese uh, prisons, which are not nice places to be. They're brainwashing. <clears throat> I've told you about Cambodia's killing fields. One third of an Asian nation murdered in four years' time. Yeah, I think that clock died. No, that clock died. I don't have time. I gotta get uh, batteries in that clock because it's messing me up. Tomorrow, we finish everything. That's going to include uh, maybe something on Cambodia. It's also going to include the um, European Union and the uh, culmination of European history. Any questions, comments, or thoughts? I see none. You may talk among yourselves until dismissal.